We all, we all set now? Yep. Okay. Uh, so we have a lot going on today. Uh, we have three main speakers, Aisha Wahab, Alex Lee, and Philip Kim. And I think all of you know who all of the, them are. We also have some Orab members who are going to do uh, presentations kind of about California policies and this and that. Uh, and we have somebody coming representing uh, the Palestinian uh, a resolution that they're trying to get the U.S. to go for. Anyway, so um, I'm going to turn the floor over right now to the co-chair, uh, Susanna Williams, and she, she's going to start introducing people and get things going. Susanna, thank you so much for everything you do for us. Thank you, Carol. Did you want me to say a few words about Dan? Yeah. Um, yeah, start? That's great. Okay. yeah. Um, yeah, like a lot of you may know, and some of you may not have heard, um, Dan Leahy, who was endorsed by our Revolution Contra Costa before we merged with our Revolution East Bay um, for his Martina City Council run, um, passed away very recently. Um, he was very young. He was 39 years old, had a family. Oh, wow. um, he was a great guy. I didn't know him. I hadn't known him for a long time but he was a boots on the ground organizer, activist. He was out there supporting his fellow, um, you know, Democrats in their run to, you know, change things, make things better in Contra Costa County and specifically in Martinez. Um, serious loss to, um, to the community for a lot of reasons. Um, he was also a district, a former district director with the um, Contra Costa Central Committee. Um, so yes, um, rest in peace, Dan. Um, you know, we love you, we miss you, and um, yeah, that's what I have to say on that. Um, so moving on to less sad topics, um, I first want to introduce our first speaker, um, Aisha Wahab. So I've heard Aisha speak a few times, and she is amazingly inspirational. Um, she is currently the mayor for Tim and council member of the Hayward City Council. Um, she was the first Afghan-American woman ever elected on to public office in the United States. Um, she remains, has always been, and remains a strong advocate for um, seniors, women, and children. Um, so without further ado, um, I saw Aisha on here. Um, take it away, Aisha. Thank you. I, I genuinely appreciate you guys just inviting me. Um, big fan of our revolution. Uh, you guys have endorsed me in the past. So um, all the work that you guys do to get progressive thoughts and voices uh, out there is incredibly important. Um, Can we see uh, your uh, Yes, and you have to give me one minute because I actually am putting you guys on speaker, but I, I will get on picture in two seconds once I pull over. Um, but uh, I definitely wanted to appreciate the fact that you guys are interested in learning more about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, the situation with the refugee crisis. Um, I will say that just this past week, the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee unanimously passed a resolution to ensure that Alameda County is open to becoming a home for these new refugees. Um, very specifically, I do just want to share a little bit of history because I feel that when we talk about Afghanistan, people only think about the last 20 years. The sad situation is that Afghanistan has had nearly half a century of war, not just this last 20 years. Um, and there's not a single Afghan that is alive that has not been directly or indirectly affected by war. Uh, I myself am the daughter of refugees. Um, almost everybody I know is son or daughter of refugees or refugees themselves. Um, I will say my parents came to this country seeking political asylum. That was the goal. My father ended up actually being murdered in New York City. And my sister and I ended up in foster care. And uh, with that said, an American judge actually made the most important decision of my life, a decision I never made. Um, and being a born United States citizen, that judge decided that both my sister and I would not be leaving the country and we would also not be separated. We ended up in foster care together and we ended up also adopted together and we were adopted here in the Bay Area and raised in the Bay Area. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for that American judge who made the right decision for the best interest of both my sister and I. 
Um, and so just kind of talking a little bit about the, uh, the Afghanistan situation. In 1973, King Zer Shah, who uh, ruled the country for 40 years, relatively peacefully, um, was, was ousted as king by his cousin, uh, Sardar Daoud Khan. Um, and he lived pretty much in Italy for the remainder of his life. Um, Sardar Daoud Khan was actually another coup d'etat that happened um, by Afghanistan's uh, people of the Democratic Party, which is actually a, a communist socialist um, uh, group, if you will, um, they actually forced Sardar Daoud Khan, as well as his entire family, to um, pretty much kill themselves. Uh, they actually killed each other, including children. Um, it's it's a huge saying in our culture of death before dishonor. And if they were captured, most likely they would have been hanged. And, um, you know, this is how they ended their reign, if you will. And that happened roughly on April 19th, 1979, which is largely known as the Russian invasion or the Tsar um, revolution. Um, the reason why Afghanistan is so important to the rest of the world is because geopolitically, it is in a strategic point uh, of, of the world. It is between Russia, China, India, Pakistan, and Iran. It also has, uh, right now, technically, the world's 21st century minerals, lithium, copper, emeralds, you name it, it has it. In fact, um, in the early 1900s, Russia actually did a, a survey of the country and noted that it was rich in different minerals, uh, minerals that are very important to you know, countries that are growing. Um, there is a theory called the Great Game Theory the great game theory is largely anybody, any country in particular who wants to have an interest in Asia and spread its influence, whether that's, you know, the British, whether that's Russia, whether that's the United States, China, or anybody else needs to be able to have influence over Afghanistan, largely known as not just the graveyard of empires, but the heart of Asia. Um, today, we are dealing with the Great Game 2.0, which is basically Russia, the United States, China, India, and Iran's influence in Asia. Um, with that said, that is why Afghanistan has had more than 16 great wars, from Alexander the Great to Genghis Khan to um, pretty much any other nation that ruled and had power and wanted to be a world um, power. Um, I will say that with that being said, Afghanistan was originally part of the original Silk Road. Um, it is also the crossroads of a lot of cultures um, from the Chinese culture, the Indian culture, the Persian culture, um, and much more. So Afghanistan's largely diverse in ethnicity, largely diverse in cultural background, as well as religion. Um, granted, right now, the majority of the country is Muslim. Um, historically, they have also been uh, a big home to Jewish uh, members of the community in the world, as well as uh, Buddhist. Um, we also had a wide variety of other religions. Now, with that said, I will just say that um, when the king was ousted, that is pretty much what perpetuated the war for several decades now. Um, and I'm going to go on camera now since I am parked. Sorry. All right. Hello. Sorry. Can you guys see me now? Yes. Okay. So with that being said, um, Afghanistan has had the Russian invasion last from roughly 1979 to about mm, late 1980s. And from the 80s till about mid 90s, there was a civil war. The civil war was started when the Russians left all, um, they wanted to do this grand assembly, which is called the Loy Jirga. The Loy Jirga was supposed to happen where all of the warlords that 
kind of banded together to fight the Russians would actually keep their troops outside of Kabul. You had two warlords that actually put their troops inside of the city, the capital of, um, of Afghanistan, which is Kabul. And um, it's uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud's forces and Gulbuddin Ekhmatyar's forces. The majority of the damage that Afghanistan has faced is actually during the civil war. It's not during the Russian invasion. And that started years of uh, a civil war. There was different alliances created, um, something that, you know, we hear today called the Northern Alliance. Um, that happened actually during the civil war. It was uh, a number of different uh, ethnic minority warlords, um, as well as others that kind of participated in, with each other to try to control the country. Um, the way the story goes is that two women escaped these warlords, uh, specifically the warlords were raping and pillaging different cities. Um, men, women, and children were victims, extreme brutality, ethnic violence, uh, human rights violations left and right. It did not matter what ethnic group you belonged to or which warlord you supported. Every single one of them committed human rights violations. Two women escaped and they knocked on the mosque of Mullah Omar. Uh, Mullah Omar at the time raised his talibs, which are students of the religion, to pretty much secure uh, these two women as well as the entire city. Uh, this happened in Kandahar. Mm. And uh, they took city over city over city from 94 to roughly they had full control of the country by 96 except for this one valley called Pinechir, which is in the news today as well. Um, at that time, the majority of Afghans were very supportive of the Taliban. Um, they were supportive because they believed that there was a sense of security. The raping, the murders, the, the horrendous human rights violations actually diminished. It was considered one of the most peaceful times of Afghanistan. And by 96, late 96, they started, you know, different groups within the Taliban actually started to commit their own crimes. Um, and the Taliban actually sought international aid and international support. And you have to understand why Afghanistan always has a relationship with outside countries. It is because they are landlocked. They are dependent on their neighbors who are largely inhospitable to them um, on electricity, food, trade, clothing, you name it, they have to rely on their neighbors to have some economy that is working. Um, at that time, President Clinton had his own problems with the scandal that he was facing and the impeachment process that he was facing. Uh, the three countries that actually recognized the Taliban government was Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. So they leaned heavily into the religious aspects of what they knew. And the Taliban were never built of community members that were leaders, tribal leaders and well-respected leaders. They were religious leaders. And none of them actually came from a significant religious background of, you know, highly educated religious schooling, right? Um, they were just your average religious leaders. Um, they leaned heavily into that and they were well funded into that. Um, and, you know, from President Reagan all the way down, a, a lot of these warlords were called Mujahideen, right? And when they made it kind of into a religious warfare against the Russians, that is when Osama bin Laden enters the picture. Um, Osama bin Laden is... Uh, largely uh, technically responsible for not only the assassination of one of the warlords from the Northern Alliance, Ahmad Shah Massoud, two days before 9-11, but obviously 9-11, uh, running Al-Qaeda. And um, a, a lot of people say that, you know, one, we as the United States had no business in Afghanistan. Some say that we should have left after 2002. Some say that, um, you know, why we were in Afghanistan for different reasons. I'm sure you guys have all heard um, women's rights, liberation, destroying the Al-Qaeda, destroying Taliban, you name it. 
uh, the reality was that Osama bin Laden was eventually killed in Pakistan in 2011, on May 2nd, 2011. Um, we, we largely hear the debate of when we should have left Afghanistan. We could have left then. We could have left a year after. We could have left years earlier. Um, who knows? That's always debatable. And when we talk about who, who is to blame regarding the current situation in Afghanistan, from the withdrawal to the peace plan to you name it, um, very debatable. You know, like I said, we can go back to President Reagan. We can go back to Carter. We can go back to a wide variety of different people. Um, and the situation ends up being that the reason why the majority of Afghans never supported the Karzai government or the Ghani government is because when the Taliban were pretty much removed from, from power with the United States invasion, um, there was something called the Bonn Conference. Um, the Bonn Conference, uh, located in Bonn, Germany, was when they had a large party that sought to seek uh, interim government. Karzai was hand-selected. The king, Zard Shah, was asked um, and forced to actually sign uh, documentation that he would not seek the crown. Um, and the Taliban were not a part of this conversation at all. And uh, the government was formed, legitimizing these warlords, the warlords that were the reason why the Taliban existed in the first place. Um, in Afghanistan, you had the president, as well as two vice presidents that were largely to appease ethnic minority groups. Um, pretty much any of these members were former warlords. They were never held accountable for the human rights violations of the 90s and 80s. They were never held responsible for any of their past crimes. And many people got rich. So the corruption that we talk about, you know, humanitarian aid and effort to rebuild that country was largely put in the pockets of these individuals. Um, Ghani's government was no different. In fact, the democratic election that happened where Ghani was selected as president the final count of votes never actually was relieved uh, or released, I should say. Um, specifically, nobody knows how many votes Ghani got. You still have two vice presidents that appease uh, two different ethnic minority groups. And then you had something brand new called the CEO, which is Abdullah Abdullah. Um, so a lot of people never had faith in this government. It was never truly a democratic government. It was never a transparent government and it was never a government of the people, by the people and for the people. Um, so there's there's a wide variety of, of criticism, all of them valid. Um, and in fact, in 2016, I believe there was a woman that spoke out against some, some corruption that she saw within the religious groups. Uh, she was actually beaten and burnt alive and a car running over her in Kabul um, under Ghani's government and literally no justice was given, um, where hundreds of people were videotaping it and so much more. So I will say that there's a lot going on. Today, we have the Taliban taking control with the backing again of Pakistan, as well as you know their former allies, but also China stepping up and already stating that they will be supporting the Taliban. Um, you have the Northern Alliance. The moment that the Taliban flag was raised, you have the Northern Alliance raising their not Afghan national flag, but their warlord flag. Everyone is reverting back into the 19s, uh, 1990s um, status. And um, literally every single one of these warlords are corrupt. And, uh, you know, some will debate whether either you support the Taliban or you support the Northern Alliance. The reality is the people have not been supported by either group. And that is the largest disservice and injustice to the people of Afghanistan. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and I will say that, you know, the future is still largely unknown. There's a lot of fighting in Pine Sher. But again, like I said, Abdullah Abdullah, who's the CEO, he went to Pine Sher. Amrullah Saleh, who served as the first vice president of, um, of Ghani, also went to Pine Sher. 
they pulled out all their military weapons and tanks and, and equipment from previous battles to protect Pine Shir, but they did not do this during when the capital was taken over. So um, they're still very questionable characters. Um, and, you know, the son of Ahmad Shah Massoud is trying to emerge as a leader of the West. However, um, it would be clear nepotism to be of support of one character versus another. Uh, for what purpose and what is the goal? That is the biggest concern. The French have already picked sides. The Chinese have already picked sides. So the next war has already started in Afghanistan. And that's sad to say, but the reality. Yeah, if anyone has any questions. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions. Uh, uh, or you can drop in the chat. Hi, this is Tina. Um, Thank you so much for the overview, um, historical overview. Um, what, how specifically can we help the people coming here now? What specific, how can we welcome them and, and, and just, you know, welcome them here? They're traumatized, we know. What's the best um, idea you have for uh, for us to to give them a little comfort. Definitely, um, I will say that uh, I, I largely like to make sure that people focus on the women in particular, as well as the children. The interpreters that were working for the United States military. I, one, I want to highlight why it's important to support these individuals. Um, by all standards, working for a foreign military is seen as treason even in developed nations. Uh, that treason, even in developed nations, is punishable by death, right? Um, in Afghanistan, they will fulfill that punishment. And oftentimes, especially with a government like the Taliban, they will not only fulfill that punishment, but they may potentially attack the family as well, right? People that are completely innocent, that have nothing to do with it, but just because they are related or know the whereabouts of the individual that served a foreign force. Um, with that said, the special immigrant visa program is nothing new to us. You know, I'm a board member of the Afghan coalition. We have been dealing with special immigrant visa recipients for roughly a decade or more. Um, the largely men, they speak English, right? So they are going to be able to adapt, but the women, their wives do not necessarily speak English. Their children do not necessarily speak English. When they are leaving Afghanistan, they are not just leaving, you know, their homeland. They are leaving their social networks. They are leaving their friends. They are leaving their, you know, family members. They are leaving their work, their jobs, their, you know, neighbors and so forth. And if their child is 21 years or older, they will be leaving their children as well. Uh, because the special immigrant visa applies to children 21 and under. Um, with that being said, uh, a lot of the women that come to this country are very much isolated, and many of them have actually committed suicide here in the Bay Area even. The, the media doesn't necessarily report on this, but um, we know that many of our uh, clients have had spouses that have committed suicide. Mental health trauma is incredibly prevalent in the Afghan community. You know, just think about it, 50 years of war, 50 years of families being torn apart, of uh, rapes, murders, human rights violations left and right. Um, uh, it has created a lot of different things from depression, isolation, um, uh, PTSD, as well as even you know, intergenerational trauma, as well as uh, schizophrenia and depression. So there's gonna be a lot to deal with. Uh, I think in the Bay Area, because it is the largest Afghan diaspora outside of uh, Afghanistan, uh, there is still a network of Afghans that are able to speak the language, interact with people, um, things like that. What we need to do is one, make sure that they are welcomed, right? They are not seen as, you know, in a negative light or anything like that. The next thing is that they're going to struggle with housing, transportation, education, healthcare, all the things we as Americans struggle with, but probably 10 times more because in Afghanistan, you can raise a family off of one income. In the United States, we all know that that's not possible. Um, so they're going to struggle. 
their children will bounce back pretty quickly. You know, children are pretty resilient. Um, in a year, they'll be able to like, you know, learn the language and, you know, start to wear Nikes and jeans and they're good to go. Uh, but again, their wives are not going to be able to. Um, so we are working to make sure that those efforts are really accounted for, that um, we don't create a more of an imbalance in their relationship, especially with power as one income, if the husband is able to work and the wife is not. Um, and they don't just have a small nuclear family like we do in the sense of like just two kids. They tend to have four to six kids, right? Um, so we just want to push that education is available. You know, we will be helping with as much as we can with assimilation to American culture. Language barrier is going to be very difficult. I will say in the city of Hayward, we are coordinating efforts and trying to ensure that we don't duplicate efforts. Uh, number one is working with the Jewish family community services. They have been incredibly supportive of the Afghan community for decades. Um, you also have our local churches and community members that are donating clothes, furniture, things like that. When they arrive on a military base, they go through, you know, different checks, quarantine, healthcare, you name it, all the checks happen. And then they are asked, what of the three cities that are offered would you go to? It's usually largely Afghan hubs, the DC area, many select Oakland. When they arrive in Oakland, a lot of these different nonprofits from the IRC to the Jewish Family um, Community Services, as well as the Afghan Coalition, reach out to them. The problem is that the federal government with the state government, the county government, and the city governments don't really talk to each other. Um, so we are trying to push a resolution in the city of Hayward to ensure that our Congress members are given information and we are given information to be able to provide, whether it be housing, whether it be connecting them to the, the correct um, organization or you know, helping in some way. The president of Chabot College reached out to me saying, we have Afghan professors and Afghan students and special immigrant visa recipients already. Uh, we're happy to help. Translation services, um, Afghan speak Pashto and Dari, the two national languages. Um, we don't have enough translation services and interpretation services the way we have it for Spanish, right? It's just a very small population. So it's very difficult to get the, the, the right language too. Um, so we have a lot of little struggles, but there's many young Afghan American professionals that are taking leave of absences from their work to ensure that this process is smoother if they volunteer. Um, Alameda County has already stated to us that roughly 1,300 Afghans will be arriving to Alameda County alone by December. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it is because um, it's not clear whether or not this, this number, and they've stated this too, if it's an individual 1,300 or it's 1,300 families, which makes a huge difference. As I said, their families are pretty large. I, I would just like to mention that uh, Sherry Johansson uh, just put something in the uh, chat if people want to read it or copy it and read it later. The Alameda County Democratic Central Committee uh, has put forth a resolution in support of Afghan refugees. And uh, I, I think people might want to copy that and not read it later. Okay, do we have- Can I just questions? ask one question? Can I just ask one question? Go for it. I mean, one request. Can you, um, can you tell us how to say welcome in, a, in your language so we could at least let them know we're trying, if you could tell us how to say welcome. Definitely. Um, it is Hush Amadin. Um, so, if I were to, let's say, spell it in the way it sounds, K-H-U-S-H, Kush, I think, Amadin, Kush Amadin, D-E-N, Kush Amadin, could you tell them that we Kush Amadin, Kush, like a, like a case, Kush, 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 Kush. Yeah. Kush, Kush, I will say, means kill, 
but hush, the KH sound means uh, basically welcome. So I think Afghans will understand what you're trying to say, but um, Kush and Hush are very similar. Ay, ay, ay. With very different meanings. <laughs> okay, we got, we got Asian, it. Asian what Carol? other questions do you guys have? I, I know that. I, Carol, I think I, Sherry wanted to say something. Um, yeah. Aisha, uh, wet, thank you so much for the resolution and especially for this talk. Um, when you presented at the, the Central Committee, um, you asked for us to spread the resolution to um, municipalities and local groups to encourage people to take these people in. Um, would you like this group and the people that some of these people in this group represent to, to also do that? It definitely. Um, I, I will tell you, we are a very small minority group, you know, largely ignored, but we've been in this country for more than 50 years. Um, Governor Newsom actually uh, pushed for $16.7 million to be dedicated to the resettlement efforts. So we are incredibly proud of that. I will say that, you know, representation does matter. The mere fact that we have a handful of Afghans that have been pushing this extremely hard, uh, we can't do it without you, right? So if you live in a city, in the Bay Area, and a lot of people don't know exactly where Afghans live. It doesn't matter if you live in Fremont, Newark, Union City, Oakland, so forth. The larger Bay Area is home to one of the largest Afghan diasporas. Nobody knows what number of population size that is because we mark the box Caucasian. We are technically brunette Caucasians by the British standard. Um, some people mark Asian, other Middle Eastern, you name it, we mark it. Um, so the number is never clear. If you can get your city councils to adopt this resolution, that is an achievement in itself. It is incredibly important to let people know that we know that there's a large Afghan community and we stand with them. Not only that, our veterans have stood with us the most um, in this fight because they know firsthand what these allies have done for them. So uh, we need to make sure that we as Americans are open um, and very supportive of these new arrivals. Yes. Mimi had a question. Uh, you're muted if you were talking. Who, who had a question? Amy Scott, Scott Slovic. She has her hand raised. I, I had my hand raised. Um, I was just going to We're waiting to see if Amy is going to speak. Oh, or, oh I'm or sorry. Can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, hi. I was just um, I was wondering. I also I'm on the issues committee for the Contra Costa County, um, you know, the Democratic Party of Contra Costa County. And this would be a great one to bring to us um, to our issues committee. If that's something you'd be interested in, we would love I would love to bring this up to the issues committee there. Definitely. Um, my email is a team at aishawahab.com. Um, I'm happy to work on this. We are bringing up a, another resolution, a little, a little bit more robust than the one for the Alameda County Central uh, Committee, um, mm -hmm. because the city of Hayward has, has stepped up and taken the lead on this um, to, to ensure that, you know, everybody is supported. I will say Contra Costa County actually has a lot of Afghans. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them, you know, Fremont is known as Little Cobble, although a lot of Afghans don't live in Fremont anymore because they've been priced out. Mm -hmm. um, so many have, including myself. Um, so Contra Costa County is home. Alameda County is home. Um, and, you know, I think uh, San Mateo County and, and their central committee has also adopted this. So we are we are happy to work with anybody and everybody because, um, you know, we need the help we can get. Yeah, and Shukufa is half Afghan too, yeah. Great. So, um, so, 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 if I email you and give you my my address, do when you will you give me the the resolution when you have it, and I'd be glad to bring it to you. One hundred percent. Okay, yep. great. Thank you. Definitely. Oh, okay. We have time for one more question, Sudia. Um, I was just going to say that there is a uh, a great Afghan professor at the College of Alameda. Maybe you know him. His name is Sadiq Popol, and he actually came here after the Russian invasion and he escaped with his family. Um, he came to the Bay Area. He actually got his doctorate in education 
and he's been teaching at several colleges, but he teaches ESL at the College of Adam Alameda. Um, I worked with him for about 10 years. I haven't seen him recently, but if he's still there and teaching ESL, he would be a great connection for a lot of the Afghanis, particularly who are wanting to learn English. Definitely, no, that, that's incredibly um, important to share these resources. Again, this community is incredibly small, so one resource is um, extremely vital to us um, and especially to the new arrivals. So uh, as much as we can, I will say, you know, I shared my story just to show that, you know, all of us play a role in people's lives, um, whether we realize it or not. And impact is profound. Um, and just the mere fact that we're having this conversation is incredibly important. Okay. We really thank you for coming here. It's like, I think I learned more in the past 20, 25 minutes right. than what I've heard from media <laughs> for years. Right. And yeah. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. I'm happy to help any way I can. I appreciate, again, all the work you guys do. And thank you so much. Maybe you should give your speech to our president. The Congress. Who's your president? <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Biden. Um, I will say that I'll be honest with you, I have been disappointed in some of the, you know, conversations I've had, you know, not only with the media questions, as well as kind of the stance that I've seen um, the United States take. Um, it's unfortunate, because, you know, I will say King Zar Shah actually used to come to the United States as a guest of President Kennedy. Pan Am had the first Asian deal in regards to globalization with Afghanistan to create Ariana Airlines. There was a mutually beneficial relationship at that point in time. The hippie trail from the 1950s to the 70s, late 70s, as well as much more. Um, I hope that we use a little bit of that hippie love from way back when because we need it rather than war. So um, I hope that there's a brighter and more peaceful future for Afghanistan for sure. So I would just like to say that back in the early 70s, I was part of the hippie influx going through Afghanistan. And I was so moved by the women of Afghanistan who you couldn't really see. They were all wearing the hijab. Yeah. And I had a couple instances where I ran into an Afghan woman off the beaten trail. And they pulled it up and looked at me and smiled. And it was such a great connection to make. And to me, that was one of the most special times I had in Afghanistan. It happened twice. Definitely. And not only that, we also had the Peace Corps in Afghanistan, right? So um, those are the efforts I think we need to invest more in, um, just the humanity, human to human interaction and connection rather than kind of what we've been seeing for the last 20 years. So many American soldiers have died as well as Afghan civilians, but not only that, but everybody affected by war. It's countless. You know, it's literally everyone who has served has been traumatized by war. So um, it's a disaster and a disservice to our own people. And we need to do better. So I, I appreciate, you know, groups like yours that have been advocating for, for let's say, progressive values. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we're going to have you back here. Uh, for those who don't know it, uh, Aisha is running for state senate uh, wow. here in California. So when we get into doing endorsements and stuff, we certainly will invite you back. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take care, guys. Okay. Uh, we had um, a, the person who was supposed to speak next hasn't shown up yet. However, Pamela Price has shown up. So uh, I think everybody here knows Pamela. Uh, we supported her four years ago and we're supporting her again. And this time it's to win. Uh, here's our future Alameda County District Attorney, for <laughs> Pamela. All right. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everybody. I just kind of dived in, was able to finally get in here. I've been missing you guys for months. Uh, but thank you for supporting me for your endorsement. Thank you for doing this program today. It's amazing. Just, you know, really awesome that we have 
folks like Aisha and members of the Afghan community in, in our midst, right? That can speak to us and tell us, what do we do to help these people? So this is a, a great um, event for you guys to do. As always, y'all are on point. Uh, I'm just gonna give a quick update. We're doing well on the campaign. Tina Flores is on this line. She's our Zone One campaign manager. And Zone One runs from Albany to San Lorenzo. There she is. Tina's been working on getting the Oakland office together and we're gonna open it up in, uh, in October. Um, we opened the Fremont office back in April and we've divided the county into three zones because it is so huge. So we have Zone One, which is where most of us live from Albany to San Leandro. And then zone two is Livermore, Dublin, Pleasanton and Fremont. And Kelsey Presnall is holding down Fremont. And then zone three, we're looking for somebody to take on zone three. That's Castro Valley, the unincorporated areas, Hayward, Union City and Newark. So if there's anyone who has managed to find some, some spare time. <laughs> We're looking for a zone three campaign uh, manager. And we work as a team, you know, and it's going well. We're gathering endorsements. We've been in, uh, interviewed by quite a few labor folks and hopefully we're gonna get some labor support this time. So happy Labor Day weekend and uh, stay tuned. The birthday celebration, you guys are co-hosting that. That's September 25th. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. And I can share with you all, not only is Mr. Danny Glover going to be our honorary co-host, but Nina Turner's coming, y'all. <laughs> so Nina's coming to help us celebrate the birthday on the 25th. So we will be getting the flyers and the links and everything out to you. Um, yeah, we're really excited. So it's a fundraiser. So get your pennies together. We're going to have a silent auction and we're putting some great stuff together for that as well. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time. You know, we're really looking forward. May, ballots drop in May and it'll be here before you know it. So thank you guys so much. And let's, let's keep it going. Let's stay together and keep fighting for what we know is right for each other and for you know the human human rights all over the world, not just in Afghanistan. And, and let's be grateful and safe. And I'm gonna close now, but I am. I've been so you know troubled by Afghanistan and Haiti and Louisiana and then New York and you know just it's it's a lot to take in. And so we all need to be mindful that got to take some time to rest and recognize that we're doing as much as we can do and we will make a difference. So thank you, Carol. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Pamela. I just want to mention that our Revolution East Bay is co-sponsoring uh, yes. the event uh, for Pamela's birthday celebration and fundraiser. And it's always great to have Pamela and Nita on something together. <laughs> and we're also in the process of setting up right now to do regular uh, events uh, at markets. So you guys, we're going to be hitting you up. We've already started, but to come up to markets. Okay. Thank you, Pamela. All right. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. Okay. So moving along here. Um, the next person we're going to have on is Igor, followed by Alex Lee. And Igor uh, is going to be talking about the recall and rooftop solar and the utility profit grab and getting fossil fuel and law enforcement out of the party and I'm sure something else. You ready, Igor? I'm ready. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me on and happy Labor Day weekend. And for the for the fellow members of my tribe, uh, a happy new year as well. Um, yes, I'm here to talk to you about all of these subjects. Um, so first of all, I will tell you about uh, the activities we've been doing around uh, slaying the recall. Um, and, you know, I'll be the first to say, well, maybe not the first, but one of many. Uh, thanks, Jessica, Shanato, to you as well. Um, 
you know, the governor has not been perfect. We have had to push him to the left on many things, but hopefully all of you will agree with me that we have to absolutely defeat this recall because the contrast between this governor and the folks, uh, particularly on the Republican side that uh, don't want to defend a woman's right to choose, which is, you know, we just saw the disastrous uh, situation coming out of Texas, which other GOP um, states are going to be copying now. Um, some, you know, the front running candidate, Larry Elder, has gone on record supporting a $0.00 minimum wage. Um, and that is a direct quote from him. Uh, these folks are anti-science, they're anti-vaccination, um, they're anti-anything that um, allows us to progress forward together. They're, they're, they don't believe in climate change. Um, and we absolutely have to stop this Republican recall from happening. So we have 10 days to do that. I have been canvassing phone banking and text banking primarily. Um, there's a lot that you can do. I'm gonna put some links in the chat right now. Um, the first link I'm going to put together, uh, this is a big push by the state party. Um, there, there are gonna be three big days of action between September 11th and September 14th. The, last three days of the recall to do just that. Um, I'm gonna put, um, so if you want to um, canvas on your own, uh, the Alameda County Democratic Party is doing a lot of organizing around that. And I'm going to post a second link in the chat right now. So you can go to bit.ly slash go canvas Alameda and canvas on your own. I spent four hours canvassing today in West Oakland. It was great. We are um, talking to folks and households who have not already voted. These are primarily Dem and Dem Plus households. So we know that um, if folks turn out, as long as folks turn out, we're gonna be in good shape. And in these last 10 days, we just need to talk to voters. Obviously, um, for most folks, the recall is not top of mind. They're trying to put foot on the table. Uh, school is back in session. Um, in many cases, for the first time in person in two years. So um, they're you know, making sure their kids can go back to school safely. So the recall, they, they've gotten their ballot most likely, and they just need to be reminded to drop it off at the polls by the 14th or mail it back in uh, by the 14th. So uh, please join me. This is super important. Uh, two weeks ago, it looked like there was a 1% margin separating the no and recall and the yes on recall Republican forces. Folks are starting to wake up um, and paying more attention. So the polls are looking much better now than they did two weeks ago. But uh, as you all know, because we're all progressives, um, we can't take stuff like this for granted. So um, I, I hope to see you all on the front lines, whether you're in Berkeley, Oakland, um, Alameda, Emeryville, wherever you, West County, wherever you might be based. Um, we need you on the front lines right now. And I look forward to continuing to join you um, all every single day to defeat this xenophobic Republican horrible recall effort. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is WTF happened at the party. So last weekend, we had an executive board meeting um, of the California Democratic Party. Um, so I'm going to give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is all of the legislative endorsements that we submitted, as well as several resolutions around housing and environmental equity and justice were unanimously approved. So that's exciting stuff, right? But as you all know, um, it's all about the money. 
show me the money. So the California Democratic Party is still not putting its money where its mouth is. It is continuing to accept fossil fuel contributions um, and contributions from law enforcement. So uh, last Sunday at the General um, Assembly meeting, uh, I joined the chair of the African-American Caucus, Tasha Brown, as well as the chair of the Progressive Caucus, Amar Shorgo, uh, and in my capacity as environmental caucus chair, um, I joined them in making a motion to finally adhere to all the recommendations that have happened so far with various task forces to uh, divest our party from taking fossil fuel and law enforcement money. Unfortunately, the party chair, Rusty Hicks, voted out of order. Um, we knew that was going to happen. We had, uh, you know, we were in conversation with him and um, we, we knew that, um, unfortunately, that is going to be ruled out of order. So until the 14th, we are very focused on defeating the recall. On the 15th, we're going to pivot back to divesting our party from these pernicious contributions that are moving our state backwards when we, we really, uh, it is black and white. It is a matter of life and death, literally. We need to stop taking, not taking, we need to stop taking fossil fuel and law enforcement money. So stay tuned after the 15th. There are going to be some actions. We're going to have a escalation in our tactics. If you want to join in, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Please reach out to me. I think we have the votes to make sure this happens particularly among, and our evolution has been a big part of this, um, among the grassroots delegates that have gotten elected into the party. The support was already present in the room last weekend. And as long as we stick together and continue to have a viable turnout model, um, it is going to happen. We're going to force a vote whether leadership likes it or not, the actual delegates of the party, the grassroots have already spoken and we are going to start putting the party's money where its mouth is. Uh, the last thing I, I was gonna say, um, and I'm gonna put a few links in the chat, there's a continued assault on rooftop solar. So PG&E, SEMPRA, which is continuing to contribute to the California Democratic Party. The California Democratic Party continues to accept it. Um, Semper has an oil and gas uh, conglomerate. They also are working with um, utilities to do major industrial scale solar and wind. And they're trying to stop the ability of you all to have access to more um, in more climate friendly and more resilient force, uh, more resilient strategies to meet the needs of today um, around having a solar panel and battery storage on your roof. Uh, I'm gonna post some fact sheets to show you exactly what PG&E, SEMPRA and SoCal Gas is trying to do. It's not pretty. Just when rooftop solar is becoming increasingly accessible, including to tenants, uh, lower income folks, uh, churches, schools, and others. They're trying to um, make sure that these things are not affordable and do not permeate. Why are they doing that? Because this is a utility profit grab of the third degree. And they're doing this because they make money off of every, um, every antenna, every single um, transmission line that they want to put in. And anything that cuts against that model is um, a reduction in their profits. So they're, uh, the only thing that they care about is money. 
Um, PG&E is particularly deplorable in that regard. As we all know, they have been starting fires for the last few years, including what is now considered the second largest fire in California history, the Dixie Fire. Instead of spending money on actual safeguards to make sure they don't start any more fires, they have been spending money attacking your and my ability to get rooftop solar in single family as well as multifamily buildings. So here's how we fight back. Uh, I'm gonna post a couple of links. One of them is uh, a petition that we're doing. We are very close to getting to our goal of 30,000 petition signatures. Um, again, the governor is not perfect, but the alternative is much worse. So until the 14th, that's what we're focused on. After the 14th, we need to get to the governor. We need to tell him that the California Public Utilities Commission is out of control, that it is completely captured by investor-owned utilities. But what's even more pernicious is, so is the AARP. The AARP has testified that they want to take away your rooftop solar and your neighbor's ability to get rooftop solar if they don't already have it. Um, other organizations um, are also on the take. So I'm gonna post another petition signature. Yes, it is extremely sad and bizarre, but um, organizations that uh, generally have a good track record like the AARP um, and like TORN, um, are actually uh, like literally, I can't, I don't want to speculate whether they are on the take or whether they just uh, fell into misinformation by the utilities. But uh, there's a petition going around to tell the AARP leadership to back off and to start actually adhering to environmental justice principles and allowing us at a time of the worst wildfires and the worst climate change seen on record ever to be able to give us the opportunity to be more resilient and to attack climate change at the source. So please uh, sign all the petitions that I'm going to post in the chat shortly and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, this is Tina Flores. I had to find the um, unmute button. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I have just a, a, a question like, why Newsom didn't, did he know about the petition drive that we were going to, that the, uh, the petition drive, did, they, did he know that this was coming down the line? the petition drive that we're gonna do now to not accept money from the fossil fuel and the police? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if he does at this time. Um, he did sign the fossil fuel free pledge. Uh, so I am new to as chair of the environmental caucus. My predecessor, Ariel Miller, the previous chair of the environmental caucus, started a fossil fuel free pledge that every candidate, if they want to be able to speak at our caucus meetings, which consistently have um, more than 300 attendees um, have to sign. So the governor did sign the fossil fuel free pledge. And now we have to hold his feet to the fire. Um, well, Let's, let's make sure he gets, uh, he doesn't get recalled, of course. But in 11 days, let's make sure he remembers the promise that he made to us when he was first running for this well in 2018. And that will be the time to remind him, not only that um, he signed that pledge, but also he needs to do everything he can to save rooftop solar because the CPUC appointees that he appoints, that the governor appoints, are out of control. 
and they're literally right now attacking the ability for folks to have solar on their roof in the in an affordable way. Yeah, great question. And happy to take any other questions. I am uh, sorry to be delayed, um, but I am um, multitasking and working to get all the links I promised um, to you right away. Um, I'm gonna post one other link. Uh, so the environment, there are members of the environmental justice community that are taking matters into their own hands and they started an amazing website that um, you all should consider taking a look at as well um, and joining us. Um, let, let's make sure that we combat climate change uh, at its core in any way that we can. Great, thank you, Igor. And as a fellow CDP executive board member, I'm down with holding them accountable. So count me in. Um, thank you, okay, sister. So next up on our schedule is Alex Lee. Alex is here. Let's say Alex is still here. Um, Carol, Alex is still here, right? Yep, I'm right here. Oh, good. Yay, I lost you for a second. Um, Anyway, so Alex was elected um, as assembly member in District 25 in uh, 2020. Um, Alex continues to be the youngest member um, of the assembly, and he is a strong advocate for public safety, housing, education, and climate change. Um, and he is has been endorsed by um, our revolution, um, both Dr. Costa, East Bay, and I believe National as well. Um, so, Alex, thank you for being here today, and take it away. Well, thank you so much, and it's really great to uh, join everyone today. Uh, my name is Alex Lee. I'm the Assembly Member for the 25th District, which includes um, Southern Alameda County and Northern Santa Clara County. So, if you, any folks are from Fremont or Newark, that's my district right now. Um, I'm very proud to have uh, won, despite not taking any corporate money, any fossil fuel money or any COP money, and I continue to do so, even though that is a uh, difficult path to do so because I am an outlier in that sense in state politics. Um, and really, we need to make sure that more people are um, not taking this money or we're changing the rules so they no longer have the ability to do so. You know, because if we don't want them to have any influence over our process of big corporations, we need to stop having that influence, that money in their system. So on my first day in office, I introduced AB20, which was to ban corporations from giving directly to candidates in California, which is something that your member of Congress and president can't do, actually. They aren't allowed to take money directly from corporations at all. Um, so they'll continue to influence um, a lot of things that, you know, obviously we just talked about a lot of policies and try to buy their way and buy their, buy their uh, desired outcome. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been very proud in the first year. Obviously right now um, we are about to enter our last week of legislative session for 2021, meaning we have four days to pass all the critical bills and send them over to the governor. And if we sell the same governor, then, you know, they are likely to be signed. And if they have a, and if there's a Republican governor, they are all likely to be vetoed. So that is also what's at stake here. Um, you know, really happy that in our first year, we're able to push really difficult things like the wealth tax, Medicare for all as universal healthcare, AB 1400. Um, trying to ban corporate money and a lot of other great things, including, um, including, well, there's a lot of great things. We did so much this year. Like sometimes I think back on it, it's like I've been in office for nine months. It feels like I've been in office for nine years just because there's so many urgent things to set up and, and work on. Obviously, uh, we have not gotten as far as we want on a lot of things, but I think it really is exciting to highlight is a bill that I co-authored and we just passed is SB2, which is a, a process to decertify police. Very far from perfect, but it is a process. It is a bill that's necessary to hold at least the worst actors accountable. If we don't even have that minimum, um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in the state legislature. And then after this week, we will recess and reconvene in 2022 um, for 2022 legislative session, which I'll be very excited to do another clean money bill that's in the works right now, uh, which is very exciting. And hopefully, I'll have more details for everyone to see in the coming months. And we're also going to be pushing our social housing bill to make sure that we can publicly develop own and maintain our own housing stock to solve the housing crisis. Because if we put all our eggs in the private market, 
you're only getting a certain type of results. And I really believe in having all options or all solutions on the table to fix the housing crisis, but we have to have a strong, robust public option. And that's what we got to have with social housing. And we can take a lot of great examples from Europe and Asia uh, that have been doing social housing as long as we have tried to in this country, but they've done things a lot better. And that's what we're going to really work on uh, in the next year. Um, and then obviously we're also going to keep pushing uh, single payer universal healthcare again. In January, we will hopefully finally have that hearing that we've been blocked so long, but my colleague from San Jose, just the South of me, Assembly Mayor Oshkara is the main author on that one. And I'm excited to see the game plan that's unveiled right after all the recall and all the madness that's over. But, you know, it's long overdue. And I really, truly believe that 2022, we can make huge strides in providing health care and housing for all. And it has to start with those two bills. That's just the beginning, folks, right? There's so much, so much more work to do. But the forces at bay that are profiting off of the scarcity of housing and the scarcity of health care are going to keep fighting a suit and nail. And that's why we're going to need your help every step of the way to get these things passed. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with you all in the coming coming year and many years to come. Keep pushing our progressive values. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, does anybody have any questions for Alex? Speak up, put them in chat, raise your hand. Um, I have Kabir and Alfred with hands raised. Kabir, go ahead. Alfred, go first. Hi, everyone. Hey, Alfred, go. Hi, Alex. How can we help you get reelected? <laughs> um, thank you, Alfred. I definitely need your help. Uh, I'm going to continue to not take any money from fossil fuel from corporations or police, but uh, that also tells you who my main opponents will be coming up in 2022. I have a tough race. Um, where an establishment figure will likely very much run and use that special interest money against me. In fact, we have all indication that they will keep doing that. So if you're able to volunteer your time, that would be awesome come, come spring. But also if you're able to donate right now, that would be amazing. If you can go to votealexley.com backslash donate or just go to my website slash donate, that'd be awesome. Pitch in $27 or anything you got. It all helps because we're trying to stay people powered and clean. So uh, if you're able to donate your time or your money, that would be really, really awesome to make sure we continue to have um, the model to prove that, you know, being corporate free works in California. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kabir. Uh, hey, Alex, I got two questions. One's really quick. Uh, so I'll ask that first. Uh, do you support fair free transit? I figured as much, but I'm going to start asking all elected officials that are people running for office. So the second one, I'm going to preface with a little bit of history and explanation. Uh, so I've known Alex for a very long time. We went to college together. He did student government together. I've known him longer than anyone else on this call. And I've been beating the same drum for a very long time. So I wanted to basically say, since I moved back to the Bay, there's been fair free transit. Uh, you want me to explain that, Jake? Is that what you're asking? Fair food would be pretty good. Free food, but we're not there yet. Uh, so basically, since I moved to the Bay, uh, there's been a bunch of like local Democratic Party races, state legislative that I wanted to talk about and kind of like get your take on like the party, basically. So 2018, I worked for Javonka Beckles campaign. 2020 was Jackie Fielder's race against Scott Wiener. 2020 also was you. And then 2021, we just had Janani Ramachandra and lose to Mia Bonta out here. And the similarity in all of those races was the ones that went in the top two against a corporate Democrat, the amount of like lies and corporate money coming in was really sickening. And honestly, you're talking about being prepared for that. Like in your upcoming race, I guess the reason you avoided that was the, it was such a uh, uh, full field for the uh, primary. You made it through with the, into a Republican. So they didn't have that chance, but basically like why, my question for you is why still function within the democratic party when like they do stuff like this, like in progressive races and spend all this corporate money, all this like Uber and Lyft money, and they come after real progressives in one of the most progressive areas in the whole country. Uh, yeah, basically my question is like, why still function within the Democratic Party? Why not try something else? Yeah, that's a great question, Kabir. And I think it's a very valid question that a lot of us ask ourselves is why try to function within the apparatus of the Democratic Party? And to be honest, I think the Democratic Party should be the party of the people. And I think we are really, really close and going farther and farther to taking over the party in that sense. And I think what you're all doing at CDP right now, the Senate, uh, sorry, at the California Democratic Party right now and changing, 
its internal laws and making them really, really uncomfortable is getting there. I truly believe in that rather than being outside the system. Uh, I think our people are there. I think the activists are there and it's I'd rather have that strategy do that rather than um, trying to lob, lob attacks from the outside in. But obviously they're always gonna do that. And as long as you know we have conservative Democrats and corporate interests align in that way, they're gonna keep allying together. But uh, I really do believe we, we are able to through action change the course of the party. Can I ask you a follow-up question then? Then how do we better like call out these corporate Democrats? Because like I've like been befuddled for this like for longer than I've even known you that Democrats will be for campaign finance because they say that Republicans are bought by the money that they get, right? But then they'll never see the back end of that that they are also bought by that same money, right? How do we like make that clear? Because I just like. I'm like, I've had it with the damn party after what happened to this Bonta Ramachandra race. I know you were really involved in like, it's just gross. It's just gross. It's really gross. Yeah. And, and you all know, I was a very big supporter of Janani and obviously it got pretty good. I mean, against the odds, but you know, I think what you got to do is really press them on it, right? Like for a very long time, politicians have across the spectrum have not had the relationship question about their donors and their positions or their philosophy, right? And if you straight up ask them, it makes them uncomfortable. And you know, in races, I'm thinking and think of many, when you bring up those topics, they get very defensive or they get very uncomfortable. And we have to continue to press that because if it is a topic that is uncomfortable for, for politicians and candidates, you know, it changes their changes people's perspective. And for instance, you know, in the, mostly in the Bay Area, I would say for the most part in the Bay Area, almost every politician, at least on the Democrat side, understand that oil money is toxic, right? Big oil money is toxic or big tobacco. You know, there are people out there who work in these traditional kind of spheres who already abstain personally from big tobacco or big oil. And I always, I am always in those, I'm always in this conversation. I say, well, why do you abstain from those things, but you don't abstain from a wholesale, right? I just draw the, you know, all these lines are arbitrary, right? I just draw the line more, most consistently where I just said all these corporations, which inherently exist to make a profit, I don't care if you're Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's or Chevron, you all exist within the same framework. I just draw the line there. Right. And I ask you, why then do you pick and choose these ones? Right. Why is it that, you know, and sometimes the answers are pretty coherent and I, I get it. Or sometimes just it's politics, right? Because they know that the moment that someone in the Bay area gets a giant Chevron check or giant, you know, Western oil petroleum check that it suddenly turns people off because people understand there is a relationship between money and, pol and politics. And I think, um, politicians understand that. It's just how do we press them further on it to be consistent on it and not take money from business, right? Instead of just cherry picking things that are topical or important, you know, I think that's why you have to keep asking people about it, you know, and I think the same way there's almost this like taken for granted aspect of, you know, if someone were to say to someone in the Bay Area, like, why do you take oil money? And they would probably be like, oh no, it's a mistake. I wouldn't do that. You know, it's like, they probably freak out, right? But you're like, well, why would you take big tech money? Why would you take this money, this money, right? Uh, so we have to start questioning that and not just let people, not let, pe let people off easy, right? You, you as constituents, everyone have the ability to question the decisions we all make, and that is within your full right. And, you know, it's up to you to decide whether or not the defense is good enough, right? But it's important to make, make them keep talking about those things because they would, I could tell you, we, they would all love to never talk about their campaign finances and pretend it doesn't exist and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm always very upfront about it, right? I, I know a lot of people don't like it when I say I'm corporate free because it's an implication, right, that other people are not. But I'm very upfront about these are my finances. This is what I do with it. I mean, it's all public information, but people want to bury that. Um, so I would just say, you know, just keep pressing people about it. Keep pressing your candidates about it. Make it contingent on your endorsements. In fact, I almost exclusively only endorse corporate free candidates. There's, there's, you know, there's scenarios in which it is so egregious I have to endorse someone who's not. But um, I always try to pressure that. And there are a lot of candidates who think because of their ha ha past or their ideology, they can just get my 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 endorsement. But I say, you know, you got to put your money where your mouth is. You know, I need to know that you will follow through on this promise because there are a lot of people who talk really good and I think they have the greatest intention in the world. But if you get wrapped up in the system where money and influence really warp everyone's decision-making, you know, it, it's, it's killer. You know, it is really detrimental to our democracy. And I know I'm getting on a bit of a rant right now, but um, I will also tell you, you know, having rejected a lot of money, I have made a lot of enemies out of it because it upsets the system. The system right now says, Everyone gets paid, whether or not you get the ultimate result you want, because it is all access, it's all influence, right? So big oil can come and tell me some things. I might not take it, and they understand that's part of the game. But if I outright reject it, 
they get very mad, right? So it's like they have no influence and they will do everything they want or everything they can to keep people like that out because they don't want to lose access. Access for them is key. You know, it's not just the vote on this bill or this time. It's a long-term strategy that a lot of corporations understand. Um, and that's just, that's just how it is, you know, and that's why you need to just keep making people uncomfortable about it. Even if you have some politicians you really love, you're just like, you know, but why do you have to keep taking this money? You know, if, and this is the thing I always tell people, you know, you always say this, people always say this, uh, taking money doesn't influence my vote. If that is the truth, then why do you have to take the money? Right. Well, why I mean, are they giving the money? Exactly. And well, or why are they giving okay. the money? Right? You just got, those are the lot. Those are the logical next questions and just ask them, right? Just ask them. That's it. Well, I have one last question because Pamela just said good rant. Have you endorsed Pamela yet? I've not yet endorsed Pamela. Okay. Well, you should do that. All right. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Um, Gordon, you have been patiently waiting. Um, and um, before you go, Gordon, hey, Alfred, did you just have your hand up from before or did you have another question? Okay. Um, so, um, Gordon, you're up next and then Steve, you are following. And then that's all the time we have for questions for Alex. Oh, okay. Uh, Alex, I want to thank you for being uh, running completely money free. Uh, that's such a rarity and a breath of fresh air. Um, I, I grew up when social issues were made make or break issues for politicians running for office. Uh, you had to support women's rights. You uh, and back when I was in school, you had to be against the war that was going on at that time. So build up a huge infrastructure of things that politicians understood they had to do. I think the litmus issue for today is getting big money out of politics. Would uh, would you be willing, A, to support public campaign financing, and B, what would uh, you be willing to do to up the emphasis in our political system on getting rid of big money? I, I think that has to come from the public. Yield. Absolutely. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. On my first day in office, I introduced AB20, which actually at first had two parts to it. It would ban corporate contributions directly to candidates and set up a uh, publicly funded election system. I found out later on on the second part, the California Constitution, because it's a great document, uh, actually prohibits us from having publicly funded elections. So you will see, I am working on this, you will see in the coming years a ballot measure to change that part of the Constitution. I don't believe it was ever the intention of the, of the original uh, Political Reform Act. It basically says you can't use public funds for campaigning, which obviously meant you know you can't embezzle funds, but has been interpreted to also ban public finance, which is a huge problem. But it has to go to the ballot, and we want to make sure it has the greatest chance. And you know there will be people out there who are against public financing because they don't want to level the playing field, and they will muddy the water by saying, oh, this opens up corruption or something. But there are great ways to do this. I'm partnering with Senator Allen to work on this in the coming years. Uh, the challenge is obviously getting on the ballot, and it's going to be a whole fight in itself. But public financing has to happen, and we are going to get big money out of politics. It's not a question of if, it will happen. It's just a matter of question of when. Okay, thank you. And Steve, you are up next, and you are our last question for Alex. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, it's, it's a winning strategy. It has to be the strategy we use. It has to be, you know, a part of it, at least we need strong candidates within the party. I'm going to say your name. Is it Kabir? I'm going to say it wrong. I, you know, I think we need to push from all yeah. sides, you know, really progressive and be our activist selves. But I honor you know, Bernie's approach to try to change things with, with from within. Uh, what Alex has done is amazing. And what happened with Jay was that she, you know, was not only because she, all the same messages, right? Where she turned every debate was on this topic that Gordon just said. She tied in, you know, you say healthcare is a human right. You take money from Anthem Blue Cross. You say you're for the working class. You take money from McDonald's. And everyone she talked to every debate she won, she got critical things. The, the difference between, I think, Turner's campaign she had money. And, and, he, and Jay's campaign is that Jay wasn't going against Mia Bonta. He, she was going against Mia and Rob Bonta. She was going against the second most powerful politician in the state. And she got Barbara Lee. You know, people were afraid to stand by her and take a chance on this really dynamic individual. Someone who I think is going to, could make, be on an, uh, Alex, and Alex, 
I, I, you know, I think that you're a high caliber person. We could see do many things. We want to support you anywhere we can because you're, you're active and going to change the world. I think Jay is one of those people, but she was going against it. So I think, I think the answer is exactly this, the kind of legislation you're talking about, Alex, and it's us. This is what our evolution and where Bernie started it. It's about, you know, killing Citizens United sometime at the federal level, but at the local level, right? You know how we just brought the Afghan issue down to what can we do locally? What can we do at our Revolution East Bay? What can we do within the state of California, within our own individual districts and communities to get money out of politics and not have our legislation or our politicians be bought and sold? Yield. See, that's a fantastic point. And, you know, that's, that's the problem, right? We, as in, inherently right now, as value-driven progressives, of the left, <laughs> we are playing an unfair system, a system that's not designed for us. You know, that's why even I know it'll be a hard race for me because I am in some ways fighting with one arm behind my back, but on purpose, because it is something I've kept my promise. It is on value. You know, it would be a walk in the park if I was just like McDonald's or Chevron. Can you just write me a couple thousand dollar check? Thanks. That would be a lot easier. So I don't have to do, you know, like that's just the rules of the game. That's are unfair. But what locally we can do within our power is I think what we need to start doing is Think, think about our local contribution limits, right? And that works for local races, contribution and spending limits, and then think about also public financing models. Um, there, there's nothing that prevents cities and or counties even from experimenting these models as you know a lot of cities across the country are doing and actually show that these, these systems work. They're not gonna ultimately, uh, unfortunately, change, completely change the system yet as long as that corporate money can keep just flooding in places, but it does have a lot to do. It does have a lot... Um, a lot of power to do so, you know, and I think if we start changing that locally and not have this culture of complacency of just going up for the highest bidder, we can start changing that pipeline. Uh, Cause right now, and I will say the biggest thing that, you know, progressives were worried about is in 2024 in the assembly, almost like a third of the house will turn out just by term limits. Maybe people will also leave earlier on their own. Um, but there's a real potential for us to finally have a true deep progressive majority. And I'm going to do all I can to hopefully be in that majority right, and stay there, but also to make sure it is more and more fair for people with values to get in there. Because right now this system, and I can tell you all the forces of conservatism have so much money in their war chest, they're predisposed right now to win just on a resource level. But I think the people of California with us, and I think our values are right for the modern age, uh, we just got to make sure that we are letting people know, right, how to figure out, you know, how, you know, the big thing we always say, right, is how do we follow or ask people to follow the money, right? And if people aren't aware that someone is taking Uber and Lyft money and not where how to find these things and be thinking about these things, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for us to, to suss out essentially who is the right person. Even if they all say, you know, everyone across the, I will tell you, I can guarantee you everywhere, any Democrat in four or five years will all say they're progressive, right? No matter what their actual values are, because they know it is a popular brand now. So just co-opt, they'll keep co-opting the language, co-opting our behavior, but ultimately, you know, really, really comes down to whether, whether you put your money where your mouth is. So keep pressuring people, see what you can do locally to build publicly financed election systems and, you know, keep up the great work you constantly all do out there and keep the pressure. Awesome. Thank you, Assemblymember Lee, for being here. Always a pleasure. Um, and if you can, um, Alex dropped his um, donate link in chat. Um, it's votealexlee.com, right, Alex? The dot com, right? Um, yes, yeah, so if you can, um, you know, send him a Bernie 27 bucks or more if you can. Um, and let's definitely keep him in office and get more um, assembly members like him um, to, so he can continue his work. So thank you very much. Um, and next up, we have Philip Kim. Um, I've worked with Philip in the trenches on the Bernie campaign. Um, he is currently a community organizer at the um, California Nurses Association, has been working um, with them and um, you know, we're working to get us all single payer in healthcare for quite some time now. Um, as I mentioned, Bernie Sanders, who's a former outreach coordinator for Bernie, um, Bernie delegate, and currently working on the um, CRO Act, which is AB 1400, which would give Californians um, guaranteed health care. So, Phil, um, what do you have for us today? Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, and thanks for having me speak. Thanks, Susanna. Um, so, yeah, my name is Phil. I'm with the California Nurses Association. Um, First, uh, just really quickly, I want to mention um, we are urging everyone um, to vote no on the recall. We can't have a far right extremist uh, Republican in the governor's seat. So if you want to phone bank with us, we have a few phone banking opportunities uh, before the 14th. 
Um, but the main reason I'm here is to give the CalCare update, like Susanna said. So um, we have a major problem in this country and in California. We have over 3 million Californians uh, with no health insurance. There's 12 million uh, Californians that are underinsured, meaning they have insurance, but they can't afford to use it because of copays and deductibles. And we're still in the middle of a deadly pandemic in the fourth wave now. And I don't know if you all have heard this, but a majority of insurance companies now are no longer waiving uh, the cost sharing associated with COVID treatment. They were, a lot of them were doing that earlier, but now they are no longer doing that. So you are on the hook for potentially thousands of dollars if you are hospitalized uh, or need treatment for COVID. So this profit-driven system is actively harming and bankrupting millions of Californians. We have a real opportunity for change here with AB 1400 that we think is the real solution to our healthcare crisis. By the way, thank you to uh, Assemblymember Lee. I don't know if he just left or not, but he's one of the uh, the main co-authors along with uh, Assemblymember Ash Kalra. So be sure to thank Assemblymember Lee for, uh, for doing that. Um, I uh, Am I able to screen share, by the way? I can uh, do a, oh, no, I'm not, okay. Um, well, I can give a little um, bit of a, um, lesson on um, on the policy and why it's so uh, um, monumental. And then I'll tell you about our plan for the next four or five months here, because we have a really tight timeline if we want this to pass in 2022. So, um, you know. sorry, what was that? You can screen share if you want to now. Oh, OK, sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll just do that real quick. So CalCare, I just want to share uh, these main principles of CalCare. Uh, and of what we believe are important for a, a true single payer system. So there's seven of these principles, universal coverage. So everybody's covered, nobody out, regardless of your uh, immigration status, your ability to pay, any of that, everyone's covered. A single public program, um, and this is one of the main reasons why single payer is cheaper because it's more efficient, you get rid of the millions of different plans, both private and public, a lot easier to administer. Fully comprehensive uh, benefits, medical, dental, hearing, vision, mental health, prescription drugs, long-term care, and more. Um, freedom to choose your care provider. So you can, you know, there's no more restrictive networks anymore. Uh, no insurance company saying you can't see that doctor or that specialist. Um, free at the point of service. This is really important because we don't want there to be any um, discouragement from people seeking the care that they need to stay healthy. So no more co-pays or deductibles, and it would be paid for by progressive taxation. Um, a just transition, because it is true, we're, we're switching to a more efficient system here, and there would be administrative and insurance company jobs that would be displaced. So we want to make sure all those workers are taken care of. And then finally, um, patient care based on patient need. This one gets a little wonky, uh, and I won't have time to get into it fully, but no more value-based payment models or systems that turn the providers into um, insurers, basically. We don't want there to be, to be any incentives for providers to, um, to not provide care. So that's, that's really important. Um, let me stop the screen share there. Um, and then, uh, oh, yeah, actually, a couple other policy highlights I just want to touch on. Um, and I'll share some of these links, by the way, um, right after I speak. Um, there's a special projects budget in CalCare, AB 1400. By the way, this is also in the federal bill, which is HR 1976 for Medicare for All. But there will be funds dedicated to the uh, construction, renovation, and staffing of healthcare facilities in rural and underserved communities. And this, of course, is really important because the corporate hospital industry has been closing a lot of hospitals all across the country, but especially in inner city and rural areas. Um, global budgeting is one of the main ways that uh, CalCare would fund uh, hospitals and other institutional providers. So it would make sure that the profit motive is removed from the healthcare system. So it would be able to look at what are the actual costs of healthcare. It would provide um, the, that funding in a lump sum to the providers. Um, and it's a way of making sure that the resources are allocated in a way that makes sense for public health and not for the profit of big corporate hospital chains. And then finally, I wanna mention one more policy highlight that I feel like a lot of people don't know about, but it's pretty awesome that it's in here. So um, this is the uh, bill text, if you ever wanna look it up, of AB 1400. And there are prohibitions from, sorry, I'm doing a control F here at the same time. Yep. 
There we go. Okay, so there's prohibitions in both AB 1400 and HR 1976 um, that prohibit any of the funds paid from the CalCare system to a provider from being used for the provider's profit or net revenue. So it, like I said, it totally changes our healthcare system. So it's focused on patient care and not profit making. It also uh, curbs their uh, CEO pay and it makes sure that funds are going towards care and not to you know, exorbitant CEO pay. Um, finally, let me talk about the, um, the campaign here. So um, there we go, I'm gonna share a few links here. So if you wanna read it in more detail, we put together this uh, Medium post. Um, so you can read the whole plan there. But basically there's four parts to this and we only have um, five months or so to be to get ready here because AB 1400, a lot of you've heard, uh, was turned into two, a two year bill. It was introduced in February of this year, but unfortunately the legislature decided to delay action on this, um, but it does return in January. Uh, but because it's a two year bill, um, all two year bills have to pass the house of origin as it's called by January 31st of 2022. So we only have a month to pass this through the assembly. It has to go through the assembly health committee, the assembly appropriations committee, and the assembly floor all by January 31st. So we have to be ready to really hit the ground running. Uh, and we, we have four, about four months to organize and build support to be ready for January. Um, so this is where, what our plan is. We have um, a CalCare district leaders program. Uh, and I see at least one of our district leaders here, Jessica from 84 is in here. So, hey, Jessica. Um, but there's 33 priority districts out of the 80 assembly districts. Um, and we are, uh, you know, we've got a team of district leaders that are uh, doing different campaign activities, text banks, later we're gonna do uh, phone banks. And then finally in November, December, as we get closer to January, there's gonna be legislative visits, virtual legislative visits with the assembly members where we'll be presenting these petitions showing a lot of constituent support for CalCare. Uh, in addition to that, we'll be texting. Uh, we have a really ambitious uh, plan of texting 2.65 million voters in these 33 priority districts. Uh, we're encouraging people to make com public comment at the Healthy California for All commission meetings. This is a commission set up by the legislature and the governor that's supposed to make a recommendation on how to get California to universal health care. And we've been uh, showing up every meeting once a month to make sure that they recommend a true single payer plan and not something watered down with insurance companies, which is something they bring up a lot. Uh, and then finally, stay tuned, there's gonna be a big virtual day of action, a big virtual event in the afternoon of Saturday, September 25th in about uh, three weeks. So we'll have more details on that uh, really soon. Um, since you all are in the East Bay, I just want to share that we have most of the districts covered out of the 33 priority districts. Um, and if you wanna know how we selected that, that it's basically the Democrats, on the Assembly Health Committee, Democrats on the Appropriations Committee, and then deep blue districts where there is just no excuse at all for these assembly members in, in some of these districts to not support CalCare when their constituents are overwhelmingly in support of it. So we have most of the districts covered, but we still need some district leaders in these districts that I just shared, including AD18, which I believe is the East Bay. And now we have a, a, a newly elected assembly member there. Um, so if you, I know a lot of people were occupied with the electoral stuff in that district before, but now that that's over, if you're willing to take a lead on organizing for CalCare in this district, it's really important. Uh, so please fill out this form and one of our organizers, uh, probably Riley, I don't know if you know him, but he'll reach out to you within a few days and get you up to speed. There's still time. We've already started the program about a month ago, but there's still time to get going and to start doing the, uh, the text banks. Um, I think. Hey, hey Phil. That, Phil, yeah. I can probably solve your problem. We have five. I'm one of, I think, five or six district leaders for AD15 because I just moved from the awful Trump rally pits of Danville back to through the tunnel to Berkeley. Um, if you really need someone to take the lead, I can switch back over. In fact, I think it's kind of arbitrary where the district leaders themselves are from, right? We want to make sure constituents are pressuring their their own assembly district members. But in terms of us phone banking and text banking, I think we're missing an opportunity sometimes to have the power of the larger group make the phone banks and calls rather than just having, let's say it's me and one other person in AD18 having to make all those calls and text banks. I think once we train people up, if we could 
mix the pod, just moving forward, just a thought. We've got these pods of groups that in district leadership groups have been trained. I want to know when another district leader group group about 33 is going so I can help support that because I'm already I've already got the spiel down. I already know how to use the text, um, the through text. Right. It's just a thought moving forward. But um, I'll reach out to um, Mari and Ryan and or you. Uh, I you don't want me to fill out the form. What would be next steps? If you want? Uh, you to, I will. Switch, I will switch make teams. Notes. Yeah, yeah, I will make note of that because we are having some people adopt nearby districts if their district's not one or if yours, yours is covered because you have a lot of district leaders in yours. Um, so yeah, good idea. And uh, ideally, though, we do want somebody who is a constituent because they're going to be leading the legislative visits later. So it is it is preferable to get somebody in, in the district. Man, I was a um, candidate for 8018 at the end of oh. the year. So I, mean, I, I was a longtime resident of 8018. Gotcha, so, okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, so I mean... And I have a lot of contacts out there. I, I'm, I was OR Contra Costa. We just moved over here. So if, if you do find somebody else, that's great. But you know, why don't, I'll, I'll reach out to Mari and Ryan and you in a group, and then you guys can decide what you want from them. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Steve. Um, but yeah, that's basically our plan for the next four or five months. I know it was a lot. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email me if you want. Um, and I'm also happy to entertain any. I don't know if there's time though. Um, yeah, we have time for, I've got one question in chat, and um, we have time for one other super quick question. Um, so I've got Amy's hand up. Um, I'm assuming Steve's is still up just from before. So Michael Chang's question in chat is, why is there even consideration for a CEO in the CalCare program? Oh, that's a quick question. Um, so CalCare, some, like, a sing like single payer systems do and like Medicare for all do, it would not replace the providers. It would not take those over to be publicly owned. Um, so there would still be CEOs of various hospitals and whatnot, but it would remove the profit motive uh, from uh, how they operate and it would curb, they're not allowed to have excessive CEO pay for those hospitals. Great, thank you, Phil. Um, Amy, you had a question? Yeah, hey, Philip, Amy Scott Slovic. I'm a nurse of CNA. <laughs> so um, I have a question, though. So, so you know, we've been working really hard. Up, we just had that meeting with Bernie where we were working on um, the expansion for the Medicare for all, but uh, that isn't quite Medicare for all yet, but the expansion they're trying to get through right now, right, down to age 60 and a little bit more inclusive. If that passes and CalCare passes, what happens? Which one, which one happens? Is it the state one, the CalCare that would then take effect? Um, or would it be underneath, would we be covered under the Cal, I mean, the Medicare with the, the, the changes, you know, the decreased age? Yeah, that's a good question. So you're talking about the Medicare expansion effort that Bernie's working on, hard at work, yeah. fighting for us in the, rec the budget reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. um, and he wants to expand the benefits covered by Medicare to include dental, vision, hearing. So um, if that happens, uh, so, you know, and hopefully it does happen, then CalCare would just pick up the rest of what's not covered, basically. The difference in California. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, one more thing I forgot to mention, um, uh, and you reminded me, because we have a whole nother national campaign for Medicare for All happening at the same time. We're fighting for both simultaneously, because ultimately the goal, the ultimate goal is, um, is federal Medicare for All to cover the whole country. Um, but we're doing a, um, a panel for um, focused on CVS Health. A lot of people don't know this, but CVS Health is now the largest healthcare corporation in the world because they bought Aetna, the um, insurer, and they have all the pharmacies and they have other healthcare, you know, ventures. Um, so we're doing sort of a corporate campaign style uh, campaign based on CVS Health. And we have a panel coming up. I think it's September 9th, if you click on it. But that's the, the registration link for that, for that panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, I think we probably all are definitely supporting your efforts in every way we can. So definitely um, check out the links that, um, that Phil had posted and um, participate where you can. Um, okay, so I am turning this back over to Carol, who is gonna introduce our next speaker. Carol, are you muted? Carol, you muted. How's that? Better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, yeah. So the next person that we have on 
is Reverend, I lost his name here, Michael Yoshi, who's got a resolution regarding uh, the land confiscation going on in Palestine. And he would like our support on this also. So uh, go ahead, Michael. Oh, just a clarification. So this was resolution was submitted by Austin Tam. And is this uh, something you have to vote on here today or? No, it, we won't be voting on it. We'll discuss it at our next uh, board meeting and. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have some uh, slides if I can do a share screen. Okay. Sure, let me set that up real quick. So while we're setting that up, uh, uh, my name is Michael Yoshi. I co-chair a group called Friends of Wadi Fuking, which is based in uh, here in California. It's a partnership with a uh, Palestinian village in the West Bank. And I'll pull up my slides. So our partnership uh, supports community development work there. We take annual trips to the region and do advocacy work as well. This was a slide from one of our early trips. I'm gonna move through this very quickly because I know you have some limited time. These were trips that we've taken. We tri take trips every year. So we have a lot of people who've been there and have been exposed. So Wadi Fukin is a small village in the West Bank of the Palestinian territories. It's located just south of um, Jerusalem and Bethlehem. This is a closer look at it. This is the green line here, the um, recognized boundary to Israel to the left and Palestine territories to the right. Wadi Fukin is a small village right here on the green line, uh, very close to Bethlehem. It's in the Bethlehem district of the West Bank. And you can see the blue splotches are settlements, which are illegal. Uh, by international law, according to the fourth Geneva Convention. And you can see how much land has been taken over in the Palestinian territories. These uh, beige uh, groups here are other Palestinian um, villages, Nahalin, Hussein, Baktir, and Al Walaja, and of course, Bethlehem. And so Wadi Fukin is an um, agricultural village, about 1,300 to 1,500 estimated residents. They pride themselves on their relationship to the land and their robust produce, which is a highlight of the Bethlehem marketplaces. Like many Palestinian villages, they've got a lot of children who are trying to uh, live a regular life. But the big issue they have in this village is the settlement of Batar elite, which you can see down in the corner here before they took over land from Wadi Fukin and then the build out of their settlements. Housing activists here would be very appalled by uh, what's happening there in terms of the annexation of land and the build out of housing for settler only um, uh, recruitments of ultra Orthodox Jews coming in from, in this, in this particular case from Russia and even the United States. And Batar elite now houses about 60,000 people dwarfing the village residents of 13 to 1500. This is another before and after photo. So we like to see uh, Wadi Fukin as being a microcosm of the whole West Bank. You can see on this map here, the red splotches are outposts and other settlements throughout the West Bank. There's up to 750,000 residents now that are just in the settlements of uh, which number about 250 throughout the West Bank. And their numbers continue to increase. You may have heard recently a lot of havoc around East Jerusalem with home demolitions there and the expansion of settlements in that area. In addition to the uh, annexation of land, the settlements often will intentionally uh, dump sewage into the agricultural uh, properties of people. Here's a farmer who's very appalled at sewage damaging his crops. Wadi Fakin is also the home of um, uh, natural water springs and construction often runs down and dries up the water springs causing ecological damage to the village. This is a map of the footprint of Wadi Fakin before 1948, which uh, was then the establishment of the State of Israel, which the Palestinians called the Nakba, or the catastrophe. You can see the green portion of their land 
shrinking in their footprint over time with incremental land confiscation that's taken place. One of the mechanisms for land confiscation is to declare land, state land for Israel. And here there was a sign posted in 2014 where there was a thousand acres in the West Bank that was annexed and a large portion of that was in Wadi Fukin. At that time when they posted that sign, the following summer, there was a destruction of 1,300 fruit trees wow. in one of the farmers' land. They came in with bulldozers accompanied by military to keep the farmers and residents out from protesting, and they summarily destroyed all of those trees. One of the things the, um, our partners decided is that they needed to be creative about how to resist land confiscation. They came up with the idea of building a soccer field with our support. So they located some land in the village that was vulnerable to confiscation and then uh, began to prepare it. We began to do some fundraising on our end. This helped them have some jobs for construction uh, and also uh, gave notice of international solidarity in which uh, we could um, be monitoring what's happening so that it would not get uh, demolished. The field uh, was able to be completed with some other funds and, um, and then uh, following that, uh, kids began to be able to play and they have an annual Ramadan tournament now for the soccer field. The issue that we're dealing with right now um, stems back to 2017 when Netanyahu came to Wadi Fukin and Batar Elite to announce publicly the expansion of the settlement of Batar Elite, but also signaling the expansion of settlements throughout the West Bank. This is a map of a 2020 plan for expansion of uh, settlements and land annexation throughout the West Bank. And even though Netanyahu who's now out of office, the current administration continues with this accelerated and aggressive plan for land annexation that's taking place throughout the West Bank. When villagers come to protest, they are met with tear gas and arrest uh, oftentimes of uh, the young people to uh, intimidate them and uh, prevent them from protesting. Uh, kids are picked up in night raids and taken in for administrative detention. So the current issue we're dealing with, which the resolution speaks to is new land confiscation uh, in the village to construct an apartheid road and this is the line of the road on the yellow here. And you can see the blue is all the settlements. And here is Wadi Fukin in the east portion of the village. The road would go through there. And this is a larger map that shows the road here on the left side, connecting up to another village called Al Walaja, where there already exists a separate uh, road. And when we speak about apartheid road, it's a road for Israelis only and settlers only, Palestinians would not be permitted to drive on those roads or else they will be penalized and criminalized. And so this road not only takes land from the people, but it also builds up the transportation infrastructure for the settlement enterprise. This is a few uh, aerial views of some of the farmland to be annexed. And as I mentioned, the uh, farmers have a strong relationship to the land and uh, the land is precious to them. So it's not only just livelihood, it's their relationship to uh, where they've lived for years and how they have um, come to understand their place in the world. This kind of line shows the route of the road. And I just got word yesterday that they're starting to take down electrical facilities and bring them into the village um, so that the uh, electrical uh, wires don't don't uh, inhibit the construction of the road. So we feel like it's happening imminent, uh, imminently. We've been doing some advocacy and this man in the middle here is the ambassador to the Belgium consulate from Palestine. He came back home and then brought the Belgium consulate uh, and a member of the EU to the village. What the resolution speaks to is contacting our uh, elected officials and asking them to intervene through messages to the State Department and to the White House. And uh, we would appreciate your support on that. We'd also appreciate, uh, I just met last week with staff of uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, they're very interested in what's happening here. We'd like them to take a lead on the Senate side uh, to write a letter to the State Department that could also be um, signed on by other 
Senate offices. We have an office in the House side that's willing to initiate a letter and then have sign-ons for uh, House of Representatives as well. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to respond. So th this village is actually the village that uh, the resolution uh, that Austin Tam has, is, it's concerning that village. Right, it speaks, the, the resolution speaks generally to the issues of um, the occupation and the Palestinian situation and then it zeroes in specifically on this village and this particular land confiscation. And then it asks for uh, action uh, from this body to um, our elected officials. Okay, uh, I think Sherry Johansson is gonna put it into the chat for people to see and we can uh, talk it, about it at our next uh, OR meeting because sure. I know they've asked us to send it like to Bernie Sanders. And so we need to talk about the extent that uh, we'll do it. Uh, yeah. You know, th this was very moving to see these slides. When is your next meeting? It's possibly Friday night, although possibly we're not going to have it this week. Um, okay. Yeah. If you could, too, um, just contact uh, uh, Bernie's office and his uh, foreign affairs staff, Matt Duss. What's um, the person's name? Matt Duss. Matt, D-U-S-S? D-U-S-S. And uh, ask them if, just tell them that you'd like to weigh in on this and see if they can prioritize this as something they can do, they can work with us on. We're supposed to be getting back to them this week anyway. Oh, okay. So you are in touch with them. I'm in touch with them. I've already had a meeting with their staff. Matt was out of uh -huh. town, but we had a meeting, a meeting with other foreign affairs uh, mm -hmm. persons. And they yeah. said they'll discuss it with Matt when he comes back. Yeah. I'll actually, I think, send it out to our board tonight. Maybe we can uh, get comments from them in the next couple of days. Okay. I'll okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Somebody have a question up for, uh, is that it? No questions? I see somebody okay. with a hand up there. Joaquin. Oh, okay. McLean. I don't see it, but okay. Joaquin, you have a question? Oh, just, um, where do they get all the water for these settlements and how does that affect the farm village? The water system is run separately. So the Israeli authorities uh, distribute water to the settlers. And, and that's one of the issues too ongoing for Palestinians is that their water is controlled by the Israeli authorities as well. And they get a very small amount compared to the settlers and uh, Israeli residents. Figures. Actually, it's a big issue. It's just something I didn't have time to go into in this yeah. presentation. Very big. Any okay. other questions? I, I, it looks like there's no more questions. Okay, Last Carol. Chance. Does thank somebody you, thank want you. to make a comment? Sherry. I, I just want to thank uh, uh, Michael for joining us. And um, and I, 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 Austin isn't here, but I'll give the uh, resolution to, to everybody. Okay. okay. I know he sent it to me yesterday. Okay. 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 Thank you, Sherry. Thank you all for making the space to okay. uh, address thank, us. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And Bye. for your commitment. <laughs> Okay, so we're moving along. We've still got 27 people. No, not really. We have uh, Jessica Tunis, who's going to speak very briefly about our Revolution North Bay group. And we have Alfred Twu, who's going to speak about a couple issues. Uh, are you ready, Alfred? Yes. Should I go okay. first or wait after Jessica? Th thanks for being so patient. It, am I up now or do you yeah, yeah, you're up and then Jessica. Okay. And then that's the formal part of the meeting. So I think some of the earlier speakers covered a lot of the current and pending state legislation that I was going to talk about. So I'm going to talk instead about the redistricting issue that's coming up. So as all of you know, the census was just done last year. And so now all the districts are being redrawn for not only our state assembly and congressional districts, but also for our local districts. Have them. Uh, the state is being drawn by independent redistricting commission. 
and you can go online to their website to give public comment. It's one thing we want to do is make sure that the districts group together people who are similar and also representatives so you don't split communities and divide up their votes. Uh, at the local level, same thing. A lot of cities have recently switched over to district-based elections. And so this may often be the first time cities are drawing districts. So think about which neighborhoods are drawn together. It's one of the goals behind the move to district-based elections is wealthier, more conservative people vote more often. They're more likely to be citizens. And so in the past, even if they were a minority of the city, they would control the entire city council. It's the switch to districts. There's an opportunity for middle and working class neighborhoods to have their own representatives as well. And most of this is going on now through the spring. I'll take any questions if anybody has any. looks like not what level was that redistricting at or that districting was that for the city council level so so cities that are that have council districts are doing it the county is doing it your transit district is doing it state assembly state senate congress every single level of government that has districts is required oh to do this right now because of the it's a census it's a post census year Gary, is your hand up? Yes. Um, Al Alfred, who, are there different committees for each of these levels that we should contact? And could you put the contact information in the chat? Sure, so I just put in the statewide redistricting public comment website, it's the wedrawthelinesca.org. And that is for state assembly, state senate, and Congress. Okay. And this is gonna be a exciting year because the Bay Area and Sacramento areas have grown much faster than Los yeah. Angeles. So we're gonna be picking up one of their seats and that will reshuffle a lot of things. Oh. And then for the How about local level, that, that's done at each level. So for example, in Berkeley, we have Berkeley's redistricting commission. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Alfred. Thank you. Okay, so our next guest and final guest is Jessica Tunis. Uh, Jessica is working with Our Revolution East Bay in developing an Our Revolution North Bay group. So we would like to hear from her. Go for it, Jessica. Hi, everyone, thank you. Um, yeah, so Hillary and I have been working on getting our Revolution North Bay up and going. We have a Facebook page, we have a, a Twitter account, an email. We've just started working on the social media. Oh, and, and then, and we had some wonderful uh, logos made for us. And we're going to thank you guys for that, for the, the wonderful logos that we got. And yeah, we're just getting started. The next step, I guess, is to get a bank account. And uh, unfortunately, I thank you so much also for putting it in the in your email blast uh, that we're starting this uh, chapter up. And unfortunately, anyone has responded to the email yet. But anyway, we're going to keep plugging along. And, uh, you know, eventually we're going to have uh, a little our, our own meeting up here. We're excited about it. So thank you for your support and every and all that. OK, do you want to put your uh, contact information in the chat? Also, sure, have, uh, the coverage of North Bay, what's it cover? So people that know people in that area can say, go here. Yeah, so that's a good question. So what, I mean, we were thinking of, I mean, obviously we're, we're in Sonoma County, so that's what we're most familiar with, but I would think probably Marin would probably count as well. What do you, what, I mean, it's still undefined. What do you think? Yeah, I think Marin, oh. Sonoma, Napa. Napa's Marin, Napa, and Sonoma would be logical. Okay. Um, that's the Golden Gate Transit District too, isn't it? I don't know. Good question. Okay. We've got to get Marvelous Marin in there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so let your folks know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To give us a, I'll put my, I'll put the our revolution email in there and also my personal email in there. But is uh, Solano like, County part of that? I don't, I don't know exactly where Solano is. No, Solano's, Solano's not really North Bay. Is it farther north or is it too far? No, is it? I think isn't Solano kind of more. Solano is just north of Contra Costa County. Yeah, Solano's Vallejo and Benicia, oh, and then all yeah. the way up to Fairfield and Dixon. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that should definitely be covered under North Bay. That's like a missing piece between East Bay and North Bay. Yeah, oh, it depends on who you talk to, who considers it the East Bay, and who considers it the North yeah. Bay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. We're looking forward to coming to a meeting with you. Yeah. <laughs> or event. Uh, okay. Um, that's all of our speakers. Uh, we're going to do a couple more things. One is at the very end, we will have Sudia singing again. But before that, we always allow people to make a comment or ask a question or you know, give out information, and they're going to be limited to one minute tonight because of time. And this is also an opportunity for people who've never been here before, are, you know, just kind of in the background to say hi, just introduce yourself, saying I'm so and so, and the, you know, what, whatever. Uh, so, um, and then we'll go into the music. So let's start with Jim McFadden. Hi, Jim. I'm his wife. He went out to pick tomatoes. I'm Joanne Consolari. Uh, and I've been, I've been listening. And um, uh, Reverend Yoshi was wonderful. I can ditto everything that he said. I've been to Palestine on uh, information gatherings. And the other question I had was, what was uh, the revolution? Could I see that picture again of, so it's American disabilities? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, he, uh, the, um, there was a- Michael, something that Michael uh, Yoshi put up? No, uh, Gordon, I think, put oh. it up. Oh, um, it's uh, run with California Alliance for Retired Americans, okay. which is a progressive seniors organization, not to be confused with AARP. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, next, Avery Arbo. I'm, am I saying your name correct? It's Avery Arba. Uh, Hi, Avery. Welcome I, to I, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm, I'm new here. I'm a UC Berkeley student. I moved here from Humboldt County, California. Um, I was a community or organizer up there for a long time, and uh, I'm happy to be here now and organizing with y'all. Uh, uh, I'm sure I'll see you all uh, around, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for stepping up and introducing yourself also. We appreciate that and welcome. Yeah, nice, uh, nice posters back there too. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, Devin Murphy. Hi, Devin. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, sharing space today and sharing community. And thank you so much for these presentations. Um, I'm not on video today because I'm trying to relax, but I am certainly uh, paying attention and I'm so thankful for this meeting. I just wanted to, um, first of all, everybody, I'm Devin Murphy. Um, a council member out of the city of Pinole, um, organizer, activist, all that good stuff, friend of friends here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make sure that folks know, and this may be, you know, uh, even a program coming soon, but, um, you know, Congress, the Senate, and Joe Biden passed the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, and that was one of the first kind of bills that passed federal legislation, which gives money to cities, many cities in the East Bay, um, as COVID-19 relief. Um, here in Pinole, we're doing a number of, we, we received $4.6 million um, 
to obviously from those from those funds and we are looking to do a few budget workshops with our community just to make sure fo- we are really engaging our own local community around how to use those funds um, the funds are pretty much open um, well here's why I'm telling you all well I think one of the biggest things I'm hearing um, is that these funds are going to things that maybe progressives don't necessarily want right so instead of supporting um, you know maybe rent relief or mortgage assistance or things that actually can help people. Um, I've been hearing a lot of things in different cities that say this money should go directly to police uh, or more police services. Um, And I think that is concerning both as a council member, but also as an activist. Um, What I'm encouraging you all to do is get involved in your own local city, ask questions from your council members to see how they're spending the funds. Um, I think this is something that is really, really important also considering how congressional members are going to different cities and like doing press events around like giving a a big check. Uh, Mike Thompson here in Panol did that. Um, And again, I just think that the rhetoric right now is not centered on what progressives have been fighting for, how we got Joe Biden elected. It's now being used um, this, well, some cities I'm hearing are using their monies in in ways that I think we could could definitely better allocate. So I just wanted to note that and just say again, thank you for sharing space with me. Thank you for letting me be here. Um, And I'm always willing to be a partner with anyone here. Okay, thank you so much, Devin. We always appreciate it when you come and drop in also. Okay, Matthew, one minute. Uh, two things. One was, I just wanted to correct something that Alex said, which was, um, it's not the state constitution that bans um, um, public financing systems. It's um, the Political Reform Act, which was a statute passed by ballot measure. Um, so it does, um, and that's why charter cities actually can do public financing. Um, so we can do, pu- we can implement it at the local level in, in our cities. Um, so that's one way we can start to put pressure on the state, but fixing it to allow everybody else to do it will require a ballot measure. The second thing was, was there was a student, I think somebody said they're a UC Berkeley student on, are they still on this call? I am. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, we used to have a chapter at UC Berkeley um, and we um, are working, we either would want to revive them or what's probably more likely to happen is at least because they dissolved um, basically as soon as the pandemic hit a year and a half ago to basically transfer their assets over. Could you send me your email and phone number? Because we need the help of UC Berkeley students to do that. And we have to wrap some stuff up by Friday if that's going to work. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, should I send it? To yeah, you the can chat private, or? yeah, you can private chat him on that on zoom and I'll, yeah send me those and i'll follow up with you and carol i want to um carol uh, board members if i could talk with you after the meeting um i need to um ask you a few things about this i think when the meeting ends it ends tonight yeah i think we can do that over email <laughs> okay ready all right, before we start singing, I had to stop live streaming. Otherwise, we're going to get dinged for 